Celia Planted a Garden, the story of Celia Thaxter and her island garden by Phyllis Root and Gary D. Schmidt. When Celia Layton was a very, was very young, she lived on a white island where the ro rocks were gray and white and the waves that broke on the rocks were gray and white, and the seagulls that rode the sea were gray and white. So in the spring, Celia planted a garden between rocky ledges, bright with yellow marigolds. Ever since I could remember anything, flowers have been like dear friends to me. During the summer, while her father kept the island lighthouse, Celia and her brothers played by the shore where pink morning glories opened to the sun and Celia found green moss and purple starfish in rocky pools. When the scarlet pimpernel flowers closed their petals, Celia knew a storm was on its way. The little scarlet pimpernel charmed me. It seemed more than a flower. It was like a human thing. In the fall, she waved at the birds, migrating south over the island to their winter homes. Blue-winged swallows and olive-brown thrushes and red-chested robins and yellow warblers and black-capped nuthatches and scarlet tanagers and golden oreos and rusty sandpipers. Even at night, they flew while the beams from the lighthouse flashed red and white, red and white, red and white. In the winter, Celia and her brothers warmed pennies with their breath and held them against the windows to melt peepholes in the frost so they could see the wild gray waves and the blowing white snow. The sea is black and white as death, with horrible long billows that break and roar aloud. One fierce winter storm blew away the island's boathouses. Another washed the hen house out to sea. Another flew through the windows and flung down their dishes from the shelves. Celia's father brought Betsy their cow, into the kitchen to keep her from being washed away, too. The spring always came, and the summer birds returned, and Celia planted a garden. More dear to me than words can tell was every cup and spray and leaf. Too perfect for a life so brief seemed every star and bud and bell. When she was 12, Celia and her family moved to nearby Appledore Island. While her father built a large hotel, Celia searched for patches of soil among the bare rocks and looked for springs to water her new garden. But she only found the fresh water that came from the rains. The very act of planting a seed in the earth has in it to me something beautiful. Still, Celia planted a bigger garden than before, even though she had so much to do at the new hotel. Artists and writers were coming to stay, and each summer day she greeted the new guests and went out to plant. She served in the hotel's dining room and went out to weed. She made up the guests' bed and went out to clip blossoms for the vases on their dressers. And on that rocky and waterless island, Celia's garden bloomed gloriously. Celia grew older and her garden grew larger. And one day, Celia met Levi Thaxter. Levi was afraid of the sea and he did not like Appledore Island very much. When they married, they moved to the mainland to raise their family. But during the long wintry days, when the low clouds were gray and the ground was frosted white with snow, 
Celia missed the tumbled shores of her island home in the rising and falling tides, in the crash of the waves on the rocks, and her garden. I long for the light and life, an ever shifted color, an ever delicious sound of the faithful old sea, more in the winter than in the summer. So Celia wrote poems about Appledore Island and the sea around it, and her words opened like flowers. The people Celia met on the island published her poems in magazines and books so that any reader could imagine what it was like to live far out in the ocean on a rocky island with the sounds of waves and the sea breezes tossing the garden flowers. Her poems even gave hope to ice-wrecked Arctic explorers who brought them along on their expedition. To feel the wind sea scented on my cheek, to catch the sound of dusty flapping sail and dip of oars and voices on the gale, afar off calling low, my name they speak. And while she wrote, Celia filled her window sills with passion flowers, pink and yellow roses, red geraniums, and white calla lilies. She started seeds and eggshells, bright pansies and asters, and cup and saucer vines. She put them in the sunlight that shone through her bay windows. And Celia painted what she remembered from her island summers. She painted the sea in top mastered sailboats. She painted purple irises on greeting cards. White china pitchers and bowls and plates bloomed with shy asters and loud poppies under Celia's brush. I want to paint everything I see, every leaf, stem, seed vessel, grass blade, rush, and reed, and flower, has new charms and I thought I knew them all before. The song sparrows fill the house. They fly into the great rambling empty space and sing. Oh, how they sing the sweetest cheerful songs all day and about all night. In the springtime, after long winters, Celia sailed back to Appledore, carrying the seedlings to plant her garden. Year after year, she planted. She planted pansies, sweet peas and hollyhocks, dark lockspurs and foxgloves, and tall sunflowers and red dahlias and nasturtiums and golden California poppies and yellow marigolds. All summer long, the flowers blossomed and brightened the island, pretty as a poem, pretty as a painting. All summer long, the birds were at home in her garden and even her house. But storms come in winter too. One night, a storm threw salt waves high upon the rocks and lightning zigzagged the sky. The wind thrashed the flowers in the garden and freezing rain poured down. The boats toss madly on the moorings the sea breaks wildly on the shore. The world is drowned and gone. There is nothing but tempest and tumult and rush and soar of wind and rain. The next morning, when Celia came out at bird peep, she found a hummingbird frozen, his ruby chest still, his claws clinging to the stem of a flattened red poppy. The storm had flown him all the way out to Appledore Island. Celia cupped the hummingbird in her hand and breathed her warm breath over his soft feathers. Nothing. She carried the tiny body in the nest of her hand as she gathered the broken flowers. Again, she breathed on the tiny body. Nothing. She breathed again 
and again. Then Celia felt a small flutter of a heartbeat. She breathed over the hummingbird again. A stirring of wings. She breathed again. The hummingbird opened its eyes. So gently, Celia placed him in a little basket lined with soft wool and hung it in the sun's shine. Soon, the hummingbird flew up into the light and dove toward a blue larkspur to feed. It was as if the hummingbird had come home, just where he should be, in Celia's garden. That summer, the hummingbird flitted through the garden, sipping from flowers that Celia held in her hand, showering in the raindrops that dripped from the sweet pea blossoms. Fall came, and Celia cleared the sticks and stalks from her garden. She dug up the dahlia buds and wayward hollyhocks. She covered the ground with dark manure. The martins almost light on my head. The hummingbirds do and tangle their little claws in my hair. So do the sparrows. I gather the seed pods in the garden beds, sharing their bounty with the birds I love so well. And when the birds flew away to winter homes, Celia sailed to the mainland. Until next spring. This is a note on Celia Layton Thaxter who this book was about. And this is a timeline of her life, to when she was born, to when she passed away. The end.